independently right now before we get started as they're checking out the audio in the other theater. Uh, welcome to Stir Trek. I'm happy to be the first presenter early in the morning. I hope you're awake. Um, had a good breakfast and coffee, all that good stuff. Excited for the movie tonight. If uh, any of you seen it, don't spoil it. Thanos demands your silence. <laughs> we're good to go. All right, I'm being told we're good to go, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning again. Uh, my name is Tim Lamaster. I'm a senior software developer at Doc Halo. Uh, actually, now Halo Communications. We just renamed uh, here in Columbus, Ohio. I focus mainly on iOS. Um, I've got a large background in Java, and my history goes all the way back to COBOL. I'm becoming an old guy. Uh, I am a hobbyist in machine learning. Um, this is an introductionally level talk for machine learning. Uh, so if you have a lot of experience, if you're, especially if you're familiar with neural networks and especially convolutional neural networks, you might not get a lot, a lot out of it. Um, I'm going to talk about the basics of machine learning, the basics of a neural network, and then the basics of what a convolutional neural network is. Um, I'm not going to dive into the mathematics behind machine learning. Uh, if you're interested in it, I highly recommend um, Andrew Ng's courses online and other resources. They're a very, very good uh, source of information to go through the actual math behind a lot of this stuff. Um, but today what we're going to do is talk about it at a high level. We're going to look at um, Kira's and and Core ML lightly. Uh, uh, Keras is a, a library built on top of um, TensorFlow for doing machine learning without having to dig into the mathematics of it, and Core ML uh, runs on iOS to do machine learning on, on device. Um, again, if, if you're highly experienced, you, you might not get a lot out of this. Um, so what is machine learning? I'd like to start with um, Arthur Samuel. Uh, he was a... Um, pioneer in hash tables. He did transistor research. He did radar improvements in World War II. Uh, pretty fascinating guy. Back then, if you um, were into software, you were into hardware, right? Because because that's how computers were programmed. So uh, had a lot of knowledge on hardware, too. But he, in, he invented the Samuel Checkers playing program. Um, and that's kind of regarded as the first self-learning program. It uses a search tree. Um, to determine reachable positions from the current position of the board, right, the current setup of the board. He was very limited by memory and speed, um, and he utilized what we now call alpha-beta pruning to stop evaluating a branch based on scoring. So if he found a branch and it was scoring low, stop evaluating, prune that off, go with the higher scoring branches. Um, this was done on an IBM 701. Uh, and, and what I find really interesting about this is um, it immediately had an impact on popular culture, right? We hear about uh, Amazon Echo and Siri and uh, Google Home and all these, you know, assistants and, and machine learning is really coming into our popular culture, but it really was from the beginning. Uh, the announcement of this caused a 15 point increase in the stock of IBM overnight, uh, which is kind of fascinating. People were, were, were psyched about this, right? Computers are gonna do things they could never do before. Um, it was even demonstrated on television, right? It played a chess, or I'm sorry, a checkers match against a self-proclaimed checkers master, um, but it beat him, and it went on to, to win sometimes and lose sometimes against people. Uh, but people were interested in this stuff right away, even in, you know, outside of the uh, computer science industry. Uh, and I found this game playing program part of machine learning pretty interesting because you can kind of track the development of machine learning over the years through the games that computers are able to um, master, right? We've got checkers in 1959, 1960s, uh, fast forward to the 1990s and we've got Deep Blue um, playing chess and beating chess masters. And then just recently, 2015 or so, we've got AlphaGo. Um, beating Go experts, right? And you can see from checkers to chess to Go, um, the capabilities of the systems are vastly increasing, right? You've got much more possibility of board setup from checkers to chess and then finally to Go. And you can kind of get a feel of where machine learning is just by looking uh, at the games that they can master. A more modern definition um, of machine learning, this is Tom Mitchell. Uh, he's an expert uh, teacher of this of machine learning. 
he's got kind of a scientific definition. I'm not going to read it. You can see it there on the board. Um, but he kind of posits the question, you know, how can we build computer systems that automatically improve with experience, and what are the fundamental laws that govern all those learning processes? Um, and this is, uh, I find this very fascinating because I've been a, a programmer all my life and, and program computers explicitly, right? Um, we don't expect uh, a computer programmer to get, a computer program to get better over time, right? Uh, in many instances, we expect the exact same output for the exact same input. We rely on that, right? We've got unit tests that run every day that um, rely on the computer doing the same, the same thing every time. Uh, but machine learning kind of turns that on its head and thinks about it differently. If the computer can learn and gain experience, um, it can get better over time. Uh, and what this allows us to do is take on problems that are too complex for people to manually design the algorithm, uh, things in the realm of computer vision, um, or software that requires itself to customize to the operational environment after it's deployed, right? Uh, Kind of one of the big first things on this was speech recognition, where you would get a speech recognition program and it would learn from you over time. We all speak a little differently uh, as we pronounce words and the computer would adapt to your, the way you say words and get better at recognizing your words over time um, and, and able to improve with that experience. Right, um, so, so why machine learning? We touched on this a little bit, but it allows us to solve a whole new class of problems, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, things that we couldn't uh, imagine programming before uh, and, and now we can tackle. So um, I was working for a company a few years ago that was purchased by IBM and uh, suddenly this machine learning was everywhere and you may have heard of Watson, right? Suddenly Watson was everywhere and Watson was going to be the solution to all of our problems. Um, as a software developer, I don't like magic. Um, so I want to understand what the new magic is, right? Uh, I want to understand how it works, where we can really use it, and kind of dispel, um, you know, the, the myths around it. Uh, and uh, at its core, you know, Watson is super advanced, but at its core, it's, it's a machine learning system. So I, I delved into that with those Andrew Ng courses and whatnot, learned a little bit about it. Um, but what I found and discovered is, is it does. It allows us to answer a new class of problems that we, we couldn't approach before, right? Um, if you had a stack of photographs and you wanted to look through them and identify uh, what was in them, right? It's easy for a child to, to do. You, you know, have a couple year old child and you show them this photograph and they're gonna point out mom and dad and Santa and their brothers and Christmas trees. And, and that's really, really easy for humans. But um, without the knowledge of machine learning, if you sat down and tried to write a program to do this, right? It would be very, very difficult, nigh impossible. Um, I would posit that if you know nothing about machine learning, if the world knew nothing about machine learning, did not exist, and someone uh, approached you with a problem like this and said, hey, I've got photos of, of anything, and I want to know what's in them, uh, the way you would end up solving that problem, given enough you know, time and resources and knowledge, is you would invent the, the, the field of machine learning to solve that problem. So it's really addressing a fundamental set of, of problems that we couldn't address before. Um, you run into this every day. Uh, you might have run into it already this morning if you've been up early shopping or watching Netflix or something like that. Um, recommendation systems is, is another thing that we do um, all the time. Amazon shows us new products. Netflix shows us new movies. Um, and that's, that's all backed by machine learning. Also anomaly detection. Uh, you, given a whole bunch of data, you may not see a pattern in that data, but through enough analysis and learning, um, machine learning can pull out uh, groups of data that it, it's related. And it might not know how the data is related, it's just saying here's, here's a grouping and here's a grouping, and maybe you need to go uh, analyze these things and eventually label them. Um, it kind of leads to two kind of main branches of machine learning, which is what's called supervised learning. And that's where we um, give the machine data uh, about something, and then we kind of know the right answer, right? We know what the, what, what the right answer is, like that image, right? We may know that that's Santa Claus, and that's a Christmas tree, and that's mom, and that's dad. And we show it a whole bunch of images, and we tell it the right answer as we train it. 
Um, you may have seen Silicon Valley did the hot dog, not hot dog uh, program one episode. That was a real program, you could download it uh, on your device, and that was trained with a supervised learning system. They showed it a whole bunch of images of hot dogs, and a whole bunch of images that were not hot dogs, actually far more images that were not hot dogs um, than actual hot dogs, and, and then as it identified images, it would see how correct it was, and it learned over time, over that experience. Uh, an unsupervised learning would be um, like those recommendation systems. There isn't a right answer for what product I need to show you, um, what movie I need to show you, but it can find groupings. It can find um, movies that I like and a whole bunch of other people like those same movies and then find movies I haven't seen uh, based on their preferences. But what we're gonna look at today is supervised learning. We're going to use a simple set of data, the Modified National Institute Standards of Technology. Um, it's a large set of, well, not large, semi-large set of handwritten digits. Uh, it's 60,000 training images, and training images are the images that we're going to show the algorithm as we train it, and we're gonna tell it the right answer, and it's going to learn through that experience how to get to that right answer itself. And then it's 10,000 testing images. And the testing images are images that we don't show the uh, computer why it's learning. And so we're introducing um, data that it's never seen and see how it can operate on new data. So that as it goes out into the real world, or how we're gonna deploy and use this thing, um, it will come across things it's never seen and we can kind of judge how it might deal um, with that. Uh, it was written by American census workers and high school students. Um, this is a remix of the original data set. Uh, when they did the original data set, all of the training data was from census workers. All of the tested data was from high school students. That was seen as kind of a bias, so they just shuffled those together. Um, they're black and white images, grayscale um, from a value of 0 to 255. Uh, the images were anti-alias, and importantly, um, the characters the digits were normalized to fit in a 20 by 20 square, so 20 pixels by 20 pixels, and then that was centered in a 28 by 28 bounding box. So you got a digit that's 20 by 20, and it's in a, inside of a box of 28 by 28. So you've got like, you know, four pixels on every side kind of centered in there. So how are we gonna tackle that? Um, we're gonna use an artificial neural network, and before I get into convolution, I just wanna explain what an artificial neural network is, right? So. It's a um, machine that's inspired by the way your brain works. Dates back all the way to the 1940s, even though it seems like it might be you know, fairly new. Uh, back in 1958, this guy Frank Rosenblatt, he created what's called the Perceptotron, um, and that's the kind of the precursor to the artificial neuron. Uh, but the research on this kind of stagnated in 1969. Perceptotrons were too simple, and we simply didn't have the compute power uh, to build out large-scale neural networks. Uh, and if you know anything about your brain, you've got a whole lot of neurons in there. Uh, similarly, when we do complex machine learning, we need a whole lot of artificial neurons. So what is an artificial neuron? Um, again, it's inspired by the neurons in your brain, but it's, it's actually a fairly simple construct. Um, like, like the neurons in your brain, it's got a whole bunch of inputs coming in. Uh, if we think back to our menaced example, we've got a 28 by 28 image. Right? That turns out to be 784 pixels. That's our input um, for the first layer in our network, which we'll get to. Um, but that comes into the artificial neuron, and then those values, those, those 0 through 255, are multiplied by a weight, each one of those individually, uh, and then summed up, and then a bias is added. Um, and the, these weights is what the machine is learning. When we start out with a neural network, we randomize those weights. That's really the best way to start. You don't want to start with them all like zeros or ones or something, you want to randomize them and you just learn the first time, just like your brain. Your brain isn't structured to recognize cats and dogs and all these things until you see them uh, and positive reinforcement from you know, your people, your parents, society around you of like, yes, that is a cat, good job. We're doing the same thing with the computer. When it gets it right, we're saying good job. Uh, when it gets it wrong, we're saying bad job and it's going to go back and adjust those weights and try to get to a good answer. Um, and, and that's really the learning. That's the experience that's encapsulated in those weights. So when you have a trained machine uh, learning network, that training is those weights. That's what's being modified as it runs. Um, and then once this simple summation is done, 
um, it's passed that value to the activation function. Um, so what's the activation function? This simulates that firing of this neuron in your brain, right? What is the output that it's going to pass on to all of its um, neurons that are connected to it? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, the important thing here is it in introduces nonlinearity so that the network can model complex relationships. Without nonlinearity in the activation function, it's actually proven mathematically that um, even the, the biggest, largest network you could build is no better than just a single layer network. That nonlinearity um, is what gives it the ability to model those complex relationships. That's how your brain works. Our brains are not linear um, machines. They make leaps of logic and, and things that seem out of left field. That's that nonlinearity that's captured there. Um, mathematically, uh, that function must be differentiable to support backwards propagation. And that's a, we'll cover that in a second. That's an efficient way to learn. Um, a common activation function, uh, and what I'm using here today, is the rectified linear unit. And that's just a really fancy way of saying the max of whatever value came in or zero. So if it's less than zero, the value is zero. If it's greater than zero, it's whatever that value was. So above, in a positive axis, it's just a, sl a slope of one line going up. Below, the uh, below zero, it's just a flat line. So it's linear in both directions, but if you look over the whole set, it's nonlinear. Um, and that's enough nonlinearity to, mo to model uh, complex relationships. But importantly, you know, max of my value in zero is a very efficient um, algorithm to run. So you can execute this, and this is going to be calculated millions, billions, uh, of perhaps trillions of times, depending on your network. Uh, so it needs to be quick. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the structure of a neural network. Um, we talked about those layers a little bit. That input layer for our Minus network is that it was 28 by 28 pixels, 784 pixels coming in. Uh, and then on an output layer, we want to identify digits. So we need a neuron to represent every digit. We're going to have um, 10 neurons, and each neuron is going to represent a digit. So if I'm lighting up the first neuron, I'm saying it's a zero. If I'm lighting up the last neuron, I'm saying it's a nine, et cetera, in between. Uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to try to drive a value of one into that neuron, and we're going to try to val uh, drive a value of zero into all the other neurons. And that's how our training data is structured. Um, we've got our input images, and then we've got a uh, matrix for every output that has a zero in every field besides the correct field for the digit. Uh, and then we're going to use backwards propagation uh, to train the network. Um, it calculates the amount of error introduced in the, in the network by each neuron. And that's why that activation function needs to be differentiable. I'm going to dive into the math um, behind this. It's really beyond the scope of this. But it's what allows for a neural network to be efficiently trained. Prior to discovering backwards propagation and its importance to neural networks, those weights that we want to modify as we learn, um, a lot of times they would just randomly modify the weights and see what happens. And if good things happen, modify them randomly, not, maybe not so randomly, in, the, in that same direction, right? And see how, so learning was really, really inefficient uh, doing it this way, right? And, and that's why the research stagnated. But in the 1970s, people started trying to understand how this backwards propagation could be applied to neural networks, chasing the errors backwards through the network. So we started that known good value of we want a one in this field and a zero in all the others, and maybe we've got, you know, really bad situation where we've got 0 0.1 in all of those, tracing that error back uh, through the network and seeing where those errors came from. Uh, research in 1986 is what really crystallized this. There was a paper written, it's called Learning Representations by Backwards Propagation of Errors. Um, it's written by a, a couple of people, Rummelhart, Hilton, and Williams, and it's really what demonstrated the efficient usage of backwards propagation. Um, and without that, we, we, we wouldn't have neural networks. They're just not efficient to train. Uh, when we talk about image recognition, we do come to quickly a limitation on what you would be a classic neural network, right? Uh, a classic neural network, what it does is we've got our input layer, so we've got our output layer, and every layer in between we just call the hidden layer. But every layer and the next layer in the network, every neuron is wired into every neuron in that next layer. So in this small example right here, I've got five outputs coming from my input layer, and I've got four inputs, 
excuse me, I got four inputs in my first hidden layer, that's 20 connections. Now that's not a lot, but if I have a 28 by 28 image, that's 784 pixels, and I've got 128 neurons in my first layer, still very, very small, very small image, right? That's not even a thumbnail these days, 28 by 28. Um, that's over 100,000 connections, so that's 100,000 computations and weights. Uh, weights are memory and computations are, are, are processing, and, that, and that's a tiny image, right? Um, and that's a, that's a grayscale image, so I don't even have three channels of RGB. If I take a 1024 by 768 image um, into 128, and this is still a grayscale image, into 128 neurons, that's over 100 million connections in that first layer. If I make that a, a color image, that's over 300 million uh, connections. So this doesn't scale up um, four images very well. Um, and it's not how your brain works for images, right? Artificial neural networks are inspired by our, our, how our brain works. Those artificial neurons work uh, very much like how the neurons in our brains work. But we can take it further. We can um, be inspired how our brain sees with convolutional neural network. Okay, um, it, it, 20 is overflow, and now 23 is also overflow. If there's anybody out there anywhere still trying to find a seat or um, get settled, 23 is also overflow. Um, so convolutional neural network, uh, we can be inspired how our brain sees. We can, f we can take this inspiration on how humans are able to adapt and learn so readily and um, further pull that into how our machine network or machine learning network works. Uh, so what this does, what this changes, is it takes into account the spatial relationships in the image. When I take my 784 pixels and I spread them out in a line, virtually, uh, and then I connect them to every single neuron, every one of those, to every single neuron in that next layer, what I'm doing is I'm saying that a pixel in the upper left and a pixel in the lower right are just as important to each other as two pixels in the center right next to each other. And that's just not simply how our brain works, right? When, you, when I look at this theater and I see you know, faces, when I try to identify people I know, I don't take account into the entire theater. I look at somebody I know and I zoom in on that person, right? And I say, oh, that's somebody I know. And, I, and then my brain figures it out and puts it in their name and memories and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so we want to be further inspired by that. So this seeks to reduce the number of connections that are made between each layer, and therefore the weights, which is memory, and the calculations, which of course are, are processor speed, or is how fast our network can learn. Um, so this leads to a faster learning system. And um, interestingly, this reduction in connection also helps prevent something called overfitting. We talked about um, that hot dog, not hot dog thing. Uh, I, I love that example. Um, but imagine if you introduced a bunch of images of a hot dog to that, to that system um, that were pretty much the same, right? You took a picture of a hot dog and it was a certain angle and it had certain toppings on it and it had a, and it had a bun. And you showed it a bunch of hot dogs like that, but you didn't show it any hot dogs that were different. Like you didn't show it any Chicago dogs. You didn't show it any hot dogs uh, without buns. You didn't show any hot dogs from a different angle. Um, but what you really wanted to do was be able to identify a hot dog in any situation. Well, you're kind of doing what would be thought of as, as, as overfitting, right? If you then showed it a, a bare hot dog, it would probably say, that's not a hot dog um, because you didn't train it. You trained it very specifically on um, that particular image of a hot dog. Uh, so what this reduction in connection does is how actually helps prevent that overfitting. So instead of learning exactly, in the case of our menace, exactly how these people drew a one or drew a two or a three or whatever, it's gonna learn in general what a one and a two and a three look like. Um, so that when I draw my one, which isn't in this set, um, it can recognize that and it doesn't say, oh, that's not a digit I recognize or that's an eight, even though I drew a three because uh, my handwriting's poor, right? So we introduced a new word, convolution. Um, what is a convolution, right? So you've run into this before, maybe not in a machine learning um, aspect, but you've run into this with um, Gaussian blur filters uh, in Photoshop or Instagram or whatever, uh, sharpen filters, uh, and even edge detection, like a Sobel edge detection filter. In those cases, um, that filter, that kernel here in the middle, those are predefined to do something we want to an image. Um, but in our convolutional neural network, 
the kernel, those are those weights that we saw in the um, artificial neuron. We're going to randomize those kernels, and those are those weights we're going to adjust as we train the network. Um, and note, when we're doing this, this isn't typical matrix multiplication. This is element-wise, so we're going to multiply each element um, in our receptive field. I'll cover that word in a second. Uh, by the value in the kernel, and then we're adding those together to get that output value. So it's very much how our artificial neuron works. We've got those weights um, that we're going to learn, but the difference is we're not going to look at every pixel when we're evaluating an individual pixel. We're only going to take its neighbors. Um, and so we're going to use the receptive field to do that. The receptive field defines the input neurons that are wired to which neurons in the output layer. So what we're saying here is this pixel in the middle in red, um, when we're evaluating it and trying to uh, learn from it and see what it is and make a determination later on, on what it is, we're gonna care about the, in, in this per particular receptive field, it's immediate neighbors. And we're gonna use that to generate our output value. Right? So we're taking the pix pixels that are spatially near each other to determine the output and that operates way more like our brain operates than trying to evaluate every pixel together. Um, that again, those pixels in the upper left are not directly related to pixels in the lower right. This provides that reduction in the number of connections, reducing the complexity, improving speed, and preventing overfitting. Um, so here we see a receptive field of three by three would produce um, nine connections per neuron in the output layer instead of 784 connections and a classic neural network to, eat, to each um, input. So you can see there's a dramatic reduction in the number of connections, uh, dramatic reduction in the number of weights and computation requ required. And then what we do is we scan over, um, we move that receptive field with the stride. We scan over the input image and we produce the output into our next layer of neurons. Um, we could also alter the stride instead of moving pixel by pixel, uh, but that would actually alter the output uh, size of the output field, which is fine. You can actually do that, and it's totally fine. Uh, but to keep things simple, a lot of times you use a stride of one, and so your input size and your output size are actually the same. You get a one-to-one -one mapping. So if you have 28 by 28, um, as you scan over that, you get 28 by 28 image uh, pixels out, right? Um, and so again, uh, importantly, the, the weights that, that we are learning is that kernel, that convolutional kernel. Um, and the output of a convolution, once we scan over all those pixels, the output of that is called a feature map. Um, it's also called an activation map as it, because it represents the activation of the neurons in that layer through the network. But uh, importantly, it's called a feature map because it represents the features that are extracted by that convolutional filter. Instead of a predefined filter like a Gaussian blur or a sharpen or, or what have you, we're creating a filter as we go. So if we talk about our digits, right, if you imagine what digits look like, we're creating filters that learn a three might have a curve here, a one might have a sharp angle here, a nine might have a straight line and a curve. It's learning the features of our images that we pass in to identify those later and assuming that those features can be um, broadly general, generalized to learn um, one digit from another. And of course, if we have lots of neurons, we could apply that um, to you know, things like Santa Claus and airplanes and you know, Avengers, identify Iron Man. Uh, so there's one of these per filter um, in our network, and each, each filter produces a, produces a feature map. Um, and then we get a, a basically a filter for every layer in our network. So a 32 filter layer will produce 32 feature maps. Um, so if I come into with my 28 by 28 and then I create a uh, convolutional um, uh, convolution with like, like that three by three, I'm gonna create like 32 of those three by three filters. I'm gonna extract 32 feature maps. And then we're gonna stack those to create the output. So I'm gonna keep that 28 by 28 because I want to keep that spatial relationship of the image throughout my entire network but I'm gonna create 32 feature maps, I'm gonna stack those up, and then when I go to the next layer in my network, I'm gonna go through each one of those feature maps individually, 28 by 28, I'm gonna scan over those, and I'm gonna go to the next feature map and scan over those and extract new filters, right? But I'm gonna keep that spatial relationship as I progress through my network. 
to another thing we might see in a convolutional network is a pooling layer. This is to further reduce um, connections and complexity and calculations and also helps reduce overfitting. Uh, this is a non-learning layer. This is just a layer you set up. Um, typically you'll see what's called a max pooling layer. So I've got a uh, six by six um, input here and I'm putting it into a two by two max pooling filter with a stride of two. And all that says is a fancy way of saying, look at um, these four by four grids and extract the highest value and throw away everything else and produce a new um, output layer. So I've applied this two by two to a six by six and it's resulted in a three by three, which is a fourth of the number of pixels. So as I go into my next learning layer, I've cut down my number of pixels by a factor of four. So way less connections again. Uh, faster training, better uh, reduction of overfitting. So what might this look like um, all set up, right? I've got an input layer. This is my 28 by 28 by one, that grayscale image. I've got a convolutional layer. I've got um, eight filters, which are five by five, and that's gonna produce a 28 by 28 by eight feature maps, so those stacked up feature maps that I've gone through scanning uh, with these filters. And then I might run that through a two by two max pool to shrink that size down to a, um, 28 by, what's that? I forget, uh, over fourth reduction in, in pixels. Um, but then finally, uh, when we have a convolutional network, we're going to flatten it out at the end and we're going to run through a classic neural network layer. So we're gonna take those pixels that are, are all spatially aligned still, we're gonna flatten them out, we're gonna pull them out into a virtual line and then we're gonna connect them to a fully connected layer. We're gonna do that artificial neural and we're gonna connect it to every layer in the neuron and then finally we're gonna connect them to that output layer and that's gonna be, for our example, that's gonna be those 10 neurons um, representing zero through nine. And we're going to do that um, same classic artificial neural network calculation that we've done uh, prior to drive, to drive to our answer. So the network I've created looks like this. We start by our 28 by 28, which is not on here. I've got a six by six receptive field with 32 filters. I put that through a max pooling layer to cut the filters down by a factor of four. I run that through another convolution um, with 16 filters, three by three. I'm shrinking my receptive field size especially since I've shrinked my pixel size. I'm saying these, these pixels are highly related. Uh, and then I'm gonna go through a max pooling layer again because I'm about to head into my fully connected layer. So I'm gonna reduce the number of neurons I have at the very end in my fully connected. And finally, I'm gonna go to my output layer of um, 10 neurons to get to my answer. Uh, how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna do this with a library called Curas. It's a high level neural network API written in Python, runs on top of TensorFlow and, and other machine learning systems. Um, and, and why would you want to use this? Is it's, um, it's easy and it's fast. Um, it supports convolutional neural networks. Uh, if you have the right setup, it supports running on a GPU for very fast training with a lot of floating point calculations, a lot of vector math going on here. Uh, and importantly for me, being an iOS developer and liking to run things on um, iPhones, it supports um, Core ML, which we'll get to in just one second. So if you'll bear with me for just one second, we're going to look at um, a script for this network. Um, and what I wanna, what I wanna uh, highlight here, is that legible, did I make that big enough? Good. Uh, what I wanna highlight here is um, this is approachable, right? Anybody can go download Kuros and Python and TensorFlow and, and get on this pretty quickly because I just described my network in you know, kind of um, human descriptive terms, but you'll see my code is not much different than that, right? Um, I've got some setup above here. Uh, Minist is nice because it's already, you can just pull it in uh, from, from resources. But really this is the core of my machine learning network. I've got a sequential model and all that means is my layers run sequentially. I'm never gonna go backwards. I don't have a recurrent neural network or anything like that. So I've got a sequential model. One layer is gonna be wired to the next layer, wired to the next layer, and finally to the output. And then I'm just describing exactly what I did. I've got this 32 filters. I've got a, a, a receptive field or kernel size of six by six. This is my rectified linear um, activation function. And then my input shape is that 28 by 28 that's, that's wired above. Um, and then I'm going to add my layers as I go and it's gonna build up this, this 
uh, this model. So I'm gonna add a max pooling layer, on size two by two, and then I'm gonna go into that next convolutional layer, 16, three by three, uh, that rectified linear unit again, and then I'm gonna flatten it. And this is what's so nice about Cura's, is it allows you to describe your network in terms that, that are easy to understand and you don't necessarily have to dive into the math behind it. Um, if you're super interested in this stuff, I, I highly recommend you know, doing that uh, uh, at some point, um, but you can play around with this stuff and learn it uh, without diving into the deep math. So I'm gonna flatten that out, and then I'm gonna go into what's called a dense layer, uh, that next layer. Dense is that just that fully connected layer. So I've got 128 neurons in that fully connected layer. I'm gonna use that same activation function, that max of zero in my value. Uh, for my artificial neurons. And then finally, I'm gonna go into my output layer. You can see that last layer, um, dense number of classes, that's just defined as 10, that zero through nine. I'm using a different activation function here because what I want is I want a one in my output neurons uh, that are the correct one, and I want a zero in everything else. And what the softmax activation function does is it, it, it will ensure that the values in each of those neurons add up to one. Um, so. If it was completely random, you'd wind up with like 0.1 in each of those. Um, but as it learns, it's gonna try to drive a value of one into the correct one and drive the value of all the other um, neurons as close to zero as possible. And you can kind of think of it as like a, like a accuracy or, or a confidence factor, right? If it's driving like a 0.95 into the one that it thinks is correct, it's pretty certain that's the, that's the answer, right? If it's driving point one into everything, it's pretty uncertain. It's just saying, I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what digit you're showing me. Um, so you can also use that output as kind of a confidence factor of, of how well um, your network is recognizing this particular digit. Uh, and then I'm gonna compile that network. Um, we've got a loss and an optimizer. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, Again, you don't have to understand the deep math behind these to learn these things. Uh, if you go through, through courses, they'll usually start with like a gradient descent optimizer because it's easy to understand the math behind it. I'm using a slightly uh, more advanced uh, model. But then I'm gonna just fit my data. I've got my, uh, my X train is those images, is those 28 by 28, those 784 uh, um, inputs, and the Y train is the correct answers. And then I have a batch size, um, and an epoch. What's important about the epoch, the epoch is the number of times I'm gonna go over those 60,000 images, um, which is pretty interesting. I'm gonna, oh, I didn't make this bigger. Um, one second here. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna train this network real quick. Uh, Yeah. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna go over um, my sixty thousand images, and it's going to learn, and it's printing out the accuracy um, here as it goes along, and the loss, um, which is the error in the network. But it's gonna go over this sixty thousand times, and that accuracy is going to keep going up. What it's doing over that time is it's adjusting those weights in those convolutional kernels, and it's getting smarter each time. And what that allows us to do is I can actually go through those same sixty thousand images. I can go through them again and my accuracy is gonna keep going up because my network doesn't reset back to its uh, initial state. It's got knowledge, it's learned now, it's going to keep learning. Of course, if I do this too many times, we'll get to overfitting and it's going to um, you know, lock in on you know, a one is only the ones that I, I've seen and then when I go to test it against real world data, it's actually gonna do, do worse than, than my training. So at the very end, we show it this test uh, test accuracy and test loss. This is those 10,000 images that, it, that the data hasn't seen. It hasn't been trained on them. Um, and we test it and we say, you know, how accurate were you? So it was 98.45% accurate, which is, is, is pretty good, though if you look at the state of the art of, of, of Ministon neural networks, it's 99.9999 something. It's actually better than humans at doing this. These digits, if you can imagine, written by high school students and, and uh, census workers, people are just trying to write these things out as fast as possible. A lot of these things look like um, chicken scratch, right? They're actually uh, humans as they classify these things. If this was a three or a seven or an eight, there's different humans that would say, well, I think that's a three, and someone would say that's an eight, and they would actually disagree, and they had to pick one. But the machines have actually been shown uh, with the state of art to be more accurate at, uh, than humans at identifying what these digits are. Um, 
So I just wanted to show Cura's a little bit to, to give you kind of an example of that. Um, and an important thing about Cura is I talked about a little bit about Core ML and what Core ML is, it's a iOS machine learning um, SDK. Uh, importantly, it supports neural networks, including convolutional neural networks. Um, it's optimized for on-device performance, um, memory and power. Well, what's important here is it's, it doesn't support training at all. So I've got this Cura's um, network and I've trained it using um, Python and, and Cura's and at the end, uh, I've saved my model out uh, in, this, in this format, and what Cura's allows me to do, um, and Core ML allows me to do, is I can take that trained model, and I can run it through a different script. Let's convert Core ML. I can run it through a different script, importing these Core ML tools, um, and I can convert that model, which has its trained weights and the entire model set up, I can convert that something to iOS can understand. Um, prior to Core ML, Apple had uh, neural network libraries inside of iOS, uh, basic neural network subroutines and metal performance shaders. But what you had to do is you had to encode, construct your network again, and then figure out how to load your weights from some other trained model into that. So it was a, a much more fraught process uh, of doing this. But what Core ML allows us to do is take a trained model, this output model, I can load it and I can convert it. Uh, and then what I end up getting out uh, when I run that is a uh, ML model file. And I can bring that into Xcode, and then I can do inferences inside of my iPhone or iPad or Mac or whatever, but I can't learn anything new, but I can make predictions. Um, and this turns out to, to be surprisingly easy to do. Uh, I can load up my model. Um, I, I, I simply, I'm using Vision, which is built on top of Core ML, because we're looking at an image and we're trying to recognize it. Uh, I'm, I'm loading that up and then as I um, predict digits, I pass in an image and then I make inferences based on that image. And I, I simply have a uh, handler that calls, it um, takes in a request with my model, I execute on that request and I end up getting out um, inferences. Uh, what's important to recognize here is that there's not a lot of code for doing the prediction, and that's all wrapped up in my model file and all I'm passing in, in my image. But if we remember when we talked about Menace, it was those 28 by 28 pixels with that 20 by 20 bounding box, right? When I take a picture with my camera or I stream video into it, it's not 28 by 28, and it's certainly not 20 by 20 centered inside of there. It's a color image, right? And it's whatever size my camera is capturing. So there's a, actually a lot more code um, what I'm doing, and I'm not gonna go through this code, but what I'm doing here is I'm taking camera output and I'm converting it um, to a 28 by 28 image and I'm trying to find a, I'm converting it to a grayscale image and I'm trying to find a centroid of bright pixels in there and put that in a 20 by 20 box and then pass that into a 28 by 28 image. So a lot of machine learning is making sure the data you're passing into that system matches the data that was trained on, because if it doesn't, it's not gonna make good inferences, right? You're, you're passing it something it's never seen in a format that it's never seen. It's not going to be able to make um, knowledge about that. That'd be like if you know I, I, I speak and read English and I picked up a book in French, I'm not going to be able to read it even though they're perfectly valid words, but my brain has no training on that. And that would be the same thing. If we pass data in a format that it wasn't trained on, it's not gonna recognize it. It's not gonna be able to perform um, Inferences, you're just gonna get garbage out. So a lot of machine learning is um, pre-processing our data so that it, it um, f fits the format that it was trained in. Now, of course, you can have um, smarter networks that are able to deal with rotations and things of, of that nature better with more neurons, bigger layers, but a lot of it is actually done ahead of time with that pre-processing. Um, I wanted to show this a little bit if we can. with me just one second. So I've got uh, that algorithm running inside of here and it's capturing pixels from this white border box in the middle. And in the lower left, you'll see what I'm passing 
actually to the neural network. So I've taken that data that's coming in the camera right there, it's pointed at my, my screen, I've converted it, I've downsampled it to 28 by 28, I've converted it to a grayscale image, and then I'm passing that to my neural network. Now my neural network has those 10 outputs, and it's always gonna have 10 outputs, so no matter what I pointed at, it always locks up while I'm talking, uh, no matter what I pointed at, it's gonna give me a digit output. It's gonna have one of those values is gonna be slightly higher than all the others, and it's gonna identify that as an eight or whatever. Um, I don't have any filtering on this to look at those output values and say, oh, if they're all close together or one of them's not over a threshold of like 50% or 60% to say, hey, this isn't a, a digit recognized. Um, what I can do, hopefully with the lights, you can see as I um, go over this, it can recognize a zero as a zero. Oh, I've locked up on me again, hold on. Uh, it can recognize a zero as a zero. Again, I must center it a little bit. My, my code for centering and all that isn't that great. But you can see what the neural network is seeing, and then you can see the output that it's, that it's thinking, the digit with the highest value. Um, as I scan over these things, I'm seeing like right through my paper. Let's see. As I scan over these things, We'll get a six. Um, lighting's bad in here. And a six and a, and a two, maybe. One second. I think that's a two right now. Lighting in here. Is, there's an eight. Um, but it's always going to make a prediction. Lighting's kind of messing with me this morning. Um, and the way that works is in my. Uh, code and a lot of like I talked about. There's a lot of code for. Um, oh, okay, thanks. Uh, a lot of code for for pre-processing the image. But in the end, I'm passing it to that predictor. Uh, I'm saying predict the digit from that image. I'm getting those confidence arrays, and all I'm doing is simply scanning through that confidence array, those ten values, and I'm finding the max value, and I'm saying that the digit is whatever index had that max value, and that's how that, and that's how that's working on there. Here. Um, so that's Core ML. That's all I've got for today. Thank you. We've got the Slack channel for questions. I think we do still have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, so if you got those, we can ask those or post on, on Slack. Um, you can find me on Twitter and my email. And all these slides and code are up on GitHub at uh, my, my, my name there is Timley81 slash Star Trek 2018. Um, I do want to, I used a lot of references in the slide. I can go back if you're trying to take a picture of that. I saw somebody. Um, but I did want to um, go my references. I used a lot of information on this. Um, it's important to, you know, call it out. We're standing, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants while we're working. Um, especially, you know, Arthur Samuel and Tom Mitchell uh, and all those guys doing important work in, in the, um, in the, the, the area of machine learning. So thank you very much. And if there's any questions, we can do that now. Are you monitoring Slack or? Okay. I can bring it up. Yeah, yeah, I've got it here. Um, so, first question I see here is how do you select the parameters for the various um, layers of, of convolutionals, right? Um, there's not a hard and fast science of that. It's a lot of experimentation. You, you know, you start out with something and you see how it performs, you see how it trains. Uh, and uh, and you go from there. So it's a little bit of bit of art. Uh, there may be some more science to it that that I don't understand. But as as you get into this uh, as a beginner, they're kind of like you know play with it, see what works, change the size of your um, kernels, change the change your max pooling layers, introduce new layers, um, play with that and, and experiment and, and learn from it. Um, so it is a little bit of. Uh, of art, though, I, I think typically, uh, as, as beginners, people start out with kind of that, that layer that I started with, where you've got a convolution and a max pooling. Um, and then you can introduce even more complex um, layers. There's things called dropout layers that actually randomly drop pixels that help, fit, uh, help correct that overfitting problem even more. So you just uh, can, can learn and explore from this stuff. Um, there's another question, is code available on GitHub? That's up on the page. That's got uh, my slides. Uh, it's got all the code for the iOS um, program and the uh, Python code for the Cura's uh, machine learning. So that's all out there. 
And that's all the questions I see that are related to my talk, I think. Oh, there was an earlier thing. I hope the volume got turned up. Um, somebody's typing right now. Uh, I think we've still got time for a few more questions. Is there any questions here? Yep. Like the pre-processing? Yeah, yeah, you can do that pre-processing however you want to do it. Um, since I'm taking data live on the phone, I need to do that on the phone. But if you were taking um, data from, from you know, a stack of images that were being fed in, you could do that pre-processing however you wanted. As Oh yeah, that's for training. So um, I'm using the MinS data set, which is already um, those 28 by 28, it's already been pre-processed. But if you wanted to take a bunch of images from the web, you could um, pre-process those however you wanted. And so let's say you wanted to take, I didn't have time to do this, but let's say you wanted to take a bunch of pictures of, of the Avengers, right, and train a network to, to recognize all the Avengers. What you would do is you download a bunch of images off the web of, of Avengers characters, and then you would pre-process those into some sort of you know, size, you know, 640 by 480, and you know the same color depth and all that thing. You pre-process those, and then you would train your machine network based on that pre-process data. And then when someone showed you a new image of Tony Stark or Iron Man, you would do that same processing on that image and put that through your network, so that your network is being um, tested against an image that matches what it was trained on. Yeah, but you can you can perform those pre-processing however you like. Any other questions in here? I got one in Slack. I'm going to bring that up. How do the additional steps, uh, max pooling, convolution affect um, learning time? So uh, the convolution is, is, is the machine learning step. So of course, that's the, that's the bulk. That's where all those calculations are happening. That's the part that's going to take the longest. Those um, additional steps, like uh, those max pooling layers, or if you or introduce uh, more complex things like dropout, those are actually probably going to reduce your learning times. Those aren't learning layers. Those are going to be something that's already set up that you simply apply to the image. It's going to go real fast, right? You can imagine a max pooling layer um, going through an image and cutting it size down by four runs really, really fast. So that's one of the reasons we put those things in is to reduce that learning time um, so we get to a better train network uh, faster, right? And as you build up big, complex neural networks, you need to run these things on GPUs, perhaps in the cloud with lots of GPUs. Um, it can get expensive and it can take a long time. Running here on my Mac without a GPU that's supported by TensorFlow and not optimized to compile, even those 60,000 images took a little while just to run through, you know, two times. So those, those additional steps reduce the learning time uh, and also um, introduce uh, reducing that overfitting, and also reduce the, the weights that we have to learn, and those weights you have to export, and those are the size, that determines the size of your neural network as you export it. So if you had a really big images uh, and a lot of weights, you might want to introduce like those max pooling layers to cut down on the number of filters and weights that you're gonna learn. So that's a, that's a great question, um, but mainly going to reduce the learning time when you introduce stuff like that. Any other questions in here? Thank you guys very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. I hope you enjoy the movie. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, kind of really cool to present in a the theater. So have a great day. Thanks.